Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 393rd episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Alex Lewis. Alex is the owner of Blackbridge Financial, a hybrid advisory firm based in Irmo, South Carolina, that oversees approximately $330 million in assets under management for 415 client households. What's unique about Alex, though, is how at age 29, he took on a multi-million dollar loan to purchase the firm from its founder as his successor, and in the four years since, has made changes to everything from the staff to the technology to the service structure to make the business what he wanted it to be, and in the process, nearly doubled the firm's AUM. In this episode, we talk in depth about how Alex gained the trust of his firm's founder and its clients by gradually increasing his client-facing responsibilities over a span of four years in advance of a potential succession, how Alex and the firm's founder negotiated evaluation and transaction terms with a seller finance note with protective covenants that met the needs of both parties, and how Alex got comfortable with a purchase whose first monthly loan payment was higher than his entire annual salary the year before the purchase and resulted in a net income of just $11 in the first year after the deal, but ultimately grew enough shortly thereafter that he was able to refinance his succession loan to make the former owner whole and reduce the monthly payment. We also talk about how Alex's firm now segments clients into five service tiers based on their assets under management and revenue and the actual differences in services that the firm provides to clients at each level. How Alex tracks his clients' individual preferences to create what he calls wow factors, such as having their favorite soda on the table when they arrive for a meeting, which strengthens relationship between clients and the advisory team. And how Alex, shortly after taking over the firm, made the decision to hire two new advisors and support them through getting their own CFP marks to be able to continue offering the high-touch services he wanted to provide for their rapidly growing client base and ensure they stayed under their 150 client per advisor target. And be certain to listen to the end, where Alex discusses how he first entered the financial planning industry, transitioning from the world of public accounting to seek better work-life balance, but taking a more than 50% pay cut to get his foot in the door. How Alex managed to not lose a single client after being forced to call 400 of them to let them know that he had to raise their fees after a key service provider dramatically increased its own pricing to Alex's firm only for them to cancel their fee increase and when the service provider reversed course, and how that action in turn built even more trust for Alex with his clients. And how Alex dug into a series of business books when he took over the practice to identify best practices to systematize his own firm's operations, from Gino Wickman's traction to Matthew Jarvis's delivering massive value, as Alex continues to evolve the business he bought from its prior owner into the one that he wanted to be for himself. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Alex Lewis. Welcome, Alex Lewis, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thanks, Michael. It's an honor to be here. I, I really appreciate you joining us today, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to a discussion of – but I kind of think of it as the the like the other side of succession planning in the industry. You know, there's a lot of conversation out there these days with advisors who own firms and are trying to figure out like how do I do this succession plan? How do I find the advisor that's going to come in and 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 someday acquire the practice so so that I can exit? But I find we have we have far fewer discussions with with people on the other end of that deal. You know, I came into the firm. Uh, was there for a few years, got to the point where I was ready to buy it, did the transaction uh, and, and moved the founder on. And, and I know you've lived that journey and, and with all the the sort of accompanying pieces that come with it, right? There's the, uh, the, the very sizable amount of debt that we have to take on to actually do this transaction. There's the fact that almost inevitably, you know, the, the, the practices we buy are not quite what we want them to be. And you have to decide, like, do you want to buy this and make it what you want it to be? And cause that just has like more cost and stress and time and risk associated with it. And so I, I know you've you've had a, a version of this journey that that you've now lived through with all the ups and downs that go along with it. And so I'm just I'm really excited to talk about what this succession experience looks like from the from the buyer's end as you come in and and you know take on the the debt to do the purchase so that you can then 
change it to be the thing that you really want it to be. I'm excited to tell the story. It, uh, it hasn't been easy. It's definitely had its highs and its lows. Um, I'm thankful I'm on this end of it now. I, I did purchase the business in 2020. And if you had told me that right around the corner, there was a massive pandemic coming, I, I, I might would have thought twice. But, um, you know, it, it has worked out. I'm very blessed to, to be on this end of it. And I'm excited to share the story uh, with you and everybody else. So I think to kick off, I'd like to actually start by having you just tell us about the practice as it exists today. So we, we kind of understand where we are, and then we'll go backwards a little bit into how, how we got to where we are today. Yeah, perfect. So as of today, uh, we have six total team members. Um, on, on Monday, we're actually uh, onboarding our seventh team member. Um, so there will be seven of us. Um, we manage just over three hundred and thirty million in assets. Um, we've got, a, a, in my opinion, a great model. Um, we um, we try to overserve clients. I know you probably hear that a lot, but <clears throat> our model is one that um, when a client calls us, we try to answer the phone, we try to help them, and be there for them whenever we can. Um, but that's how the practice exists today, um, and it's we, we've grown a lot over the last four years, uh, and. Honestly, I've I've called the former owner Reggie uh, several times for recurring advice, and um, very grateful to him and the transition process. And it's worked pretty smooth for our team. So, how how many clients is it across this three hundred thirty million of assets and and six coming up on seven team members to serve? We serve about four hundred fifteen households, uh, and, okay. and I use the word about. Um, you know, we define a household as if there are parents with children and they and they quite literally live in that same household. We bundle them all together as one household. Uh, so we have about four hundred fifteen households. Okay, so so the you know I uh, I, I opened a five twenty nine plan for your you know your three year old child. I opened the first Roth IRA for the the fifteen year old in your house. Like that's still they're literally in one household. So you're treating them as one household. I'm, I'm assuming by implication, like if it's adult children that you're maybe working with in addition to uh, uh, their parents, that that would still be two households at that point if assuming the adult children are actually like out on their own. Correct. Yeah. When, once they become a legal adult, we do separate them out into their, their own household. Okay. Okay. So 415 households, 330 million in, in, in assets, 16 members coming up on seven. So- can you tell us a little bit more about the team? Like who, who are the six people? What, what roles do they fill within the business? We have right now, we have three financial advisors, uh, including myself. We're hiring a fourth. So he will start on, on Monday. Um, and then uh, we have a pair planner and then two, two admins. And <clears throat> we're, we're lean, um, but we, we've developed, in my opinion, pretty good systems and processes over the last several years. Um, we've become pretty efficient, uh, and um, we, we do have a process for growth. We, we kind of have a trajectory of who we're going to hire and when we're going to hire the next person. Um, and so, yeah, that's the team as it exists today. So uh, so now I'm curious. So who, what is the trajectory? Like, who, who do you hire next and when do you pull the trigger? <laughs> Yeah, so we've we've done a lot of uh, different capacity analysis. Um, we we, we want to keep our advisor to client or, or to household ratio below one hundred and fifty. And so, as we start creeping up on that, which uh, if you do the math, we we kind of are now. Uh, it's time to hire. And so we we don't have firm minimums. I know there's a lot of debates about should you should you have a firm minimum firm minimum or not. Um, we don't, I, you know, as a Christian, I believe in helping everybody who needs to be helped. That's kind of our mission. One of our uh, core values is um, just helping others through faith. And uh, so when, when someone comes, we want to be available to help them. And so, uh, you know, we, we, we try to expedite our processes a little bit, try to be as efficient as possible. Uh, and so, yeah, we're trying to make sure that we keep up with the growth. Um, we've so far year to date, we've had about 52 uh, prospects. And I will say not, not everybody is what we call um, an ideal client, even though we do help everybody. Um, not everybody is quote an ideal client. We do define an, an ideal client a little bit differently. And so that is who we target, but we, we do help everybody who, who needs help. And, and so how do you define ideal client for yourselves? 
Yeah, we define an ideal client as someone who has a, a million dollars of liquid assets that we can manage for them. And so that while that is who we target, um, we do not, uh, basically, we don't say no to anybody below that threshold. And and can I ask, like, where does, where does revenue sit for the practice overall? So revenue right now, trailing 12 would be roughly 2.8 uh, is, is where we are right okay. now. So you really do net like pretty close to one percent on a on a three hundred and thirty million asset base. You're you're like eight, 80, 90 basis points here. That's correct. We do. Okay. And so and so does that mean clientele is is pretty much all individual households just of varying sizes with breakpoints? Yeah, we we have a client service matrix where we break clients out from, we have A, B, C, and D clients. And we've kind of expanded that here recently where now we actually have G clients as well. And, I'll, and I can get into what a G client is in a second. Okay. Um, but yeah, our, our A clients are above a certain threshold. Um, and then B, C, and D, um, they they mean something to us. It, it, it does depend on um, our, our service level as well. So if you're an A client, you get a certain service level. B client gets a little bit different. But um, our A's and B's are who we try to target. And, uh, and, and so, um, you know, and our rate and fee schedule is based on the account value size as well. So the larger the account, uh, the lower the, the AUM fee would be. And that's really the only fee we charge. We don't charge a financial planning fee, just the AUM fee. And and what does the fee schedule look like? Like where do you where do you start? Where do you tick down to? Our our highest fee is one point five percent, and our lowest fee um, we we do negotiate the fee once we get over a five million dollar uh, threshold for a household. Um, and so it really just depends. Um, you know, so, some some clients are in that high net worth world where, um, if, if you know, it, it could be as low as fifty basis points for some of those clients. But overall, you know, it's that that average of about one percent is what we use internally when we when we think about um, extrapolating data into the future. When we're, uh, you know, how how large are we going to be in the future? When do we need to hire? We we use that internal one percent number to to average everything. How how far how far up the scale does 1.5% go before you start notching it down? So it's ironic you asked this. We're actually talking about this together as a team at the moment. Um, so right now, 1.5% um, is for accounts less than $500,000. Okay. Uh, the, that's, the, that's the break point. The next break point is it goes to 1.25 up to 750, and then it continues to trickle down after that. But um, it's a discussion we're having in the office. We, we've actually incorporated uh, EOS, if, if you've ever heard of EOS, the Entrepreneur Operating yep. System. So I'm a big believer in, um, I, I do enjoy team buy-in because, you know, I, I am young. This is the only advisory firm I've worked at. Um, and so as we come up with ideas and listen and learn to, to how, we, how other advisors do things, I like to bring that information back to the team and we talk about it as a team. And so, that, again, that is one thing we're currently talking about is, um, how do we adjust the rate and fee schedule? Um, and so it's a good topic of conversation. The business business planning is never done, Michael, as you know. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, it's it's a constantly changing environment. You have to keep up with with uh, a changing market, and, and and we're flexible and nimble. So, so I, I I sort of infer from that, like, are are you guys concerned about whether one point five percent is is working for you? That that you you want to reevaluate this or it's been fine. Clients are happy with services rendered, and 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 on we go. Yeah, it's it's just a, it's a good conversation. You know, I I hear um, I, I obviously listen to a lot of the the Michael Kitts's podcast episodes, and I hear a lot of different rate and fee schedules. Uh, I hear a lot about um, you know it, the one percent fee is is average. Is it going to a retainer model? Is it going to a flat fee model? Is it going to um, you know, so so we're just having those conversations of where do we think the future of our industry is going? Is it AUM based? Is it a flat fee? Um, how do we start charging for things like that? And so uh, we're having those conversations as a team, and um, it's been pretty valuable. You know, we've got differing opinions, and you can even you know, even if you do charge an AUM fee, we've got conversations about. You know, is it a cliff AUM fee schedule? Is it uh, a tiered AUM fee schedule? As in, is it is it the next dollar that's charged at one point two five, or does the entire fee jump down to yep. one point two five? And and then you go back and you do the math of that, and and so it's there's just a lot of great conversation. I think that the key takeaway for our team is everything we do is very intentional. Um, 
And we try to sit down as a team and say, why are we still doing it this way? Is, is, are we doing it this way just because that's how we've always done it? Or are we doing it this way because that's the best way to do it? And so that's kind of really what I've learned through the succession plan is, is taking what did exist and just kind of putting it under a microscope and thinking, why are we doing it this way? Maybe we could adjust it and change it and tweak it and see how that works. And, and that's one thing our team's not afraid to do is we, we constantly do change and update. So now take me back to client service matrix. So so you said you 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 kind of have a an A B C D style threshold. So how do you set where where clients fall across the tiers? I mean, do you do it by some firms do it by assets, some firms do it by revenue, some firms have a like an even more detailed like you know assessment system across clients of lots of different factors that input into it. How how do you guys decide? where where clients uh, fit within the system. Yeah, I, I, in my opinion, I think an A client uh, for us is someone who reflects our top 10%. And so we, you know, that number changes every year. So if our top 10%, you know, if, if the lowest one oh. of those is, is 2 million in assets, well, then that's our threshold. And so we, we update that every year. So next year, our, our A clients, the top 10%, that threshold might change. Oh, interesting. So, so you, you kind of have it hard fixed to it will be a certain percentage of your clients that just represent the folks who are the, the, the best overall business fit for you. Correct. I found, you know, we used to do this A, B, C, and D model um, a little different. It was basically anyone who was over a million dollars, we considered a, an A client and they would get that client service level. Um, but as time went on, we had several households in that and it just became a little bit of a capacity issue. You know, how do you, with, with if 30% of your clients become an A client, um, you know, are they truly an A client uh -huh. anymore? <laughs> so it's time to adjust. Maybe, maybe some of those clients are actually B clients. And we sat down as a team and tried to figure out uh, what does a client actually mean? Is it a dollar amount? And so we landed on it being a percentage. And so we do update that every year. A clients we define as the top 10%. B clients are the top 20%. And C clients are the top 33%. Okay. And then and then that leaves roughly the roughly a third left that 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 fall down to the D client level. They do. That's correct. Okay. So uh so how do you distinguish in practice for what you do across this this client service matrix? I mean, are, are they different services they get or like something's bundled in versus not? Is it number of meetings that changes? Like how do you actually distinguish service levels in a service matrix of ABCD? Yeah, I think it's easier if we start on the other end of the spectrum, which is okay. um, a D client, right? And and I, I will say up front, if a client calls us and they want help, we're going to give them a call back most likely that day. It's, it's not like we're, we're underserving anybody by any means. Um, but a D client, it's, it, the, the client service matrix is more of how are we as a team proactively reaching out to clients. Um, and if they call us and want additional, we do that as well. But um, for someone who we classify as a D client, and, and right now that's – clients households under five hundred thousand um, dollars we we do one annual review for those um, we do one client-wide uh, event for those individuals as well we call them on their birthday um, and and so that's that's pretty much that threshold it's you know we, we, we meet with them we do a financial plan for them it's that financial plan annual update um, pretty pretty basic information and um, generally for us someone who's in that threshold that's that's really all they need Michael they don't they don't need an elaborate estate plan they don't need um, you know more than one financial plan update per year so right. for us that works out pretty well okay and then and then as you slide up that scale, um, you get more client meetings, you get more in-depth planning, um, and then all the way to that A client where, um, you know, we go to estate planning meetings with their clients. If they go to their attorney, we go to those meetings. We sit down with their CPAs as well. Um, we proactively reach out to them and communicate with them four times per year. Uh, and, and so that, it's just a different level of, of service, of proactive service. Um, we also try to incorporate what we call wow factors. And so a wow factor for us is something that's extraordinary. And so 
for example, if we know there's a client who, uh, if it's their birthday or, or if it's their anniversary, and we know that their favorite restaurant is, you know, this restaurant downtown, um, we're going to call that restaurant ahead of time. And we're going to make sure that they have, for example, a bottle of wine delivered to their, to their table. And we happen to know what bottle of wine they like because we ask them. <laughs> so we get, you know, we get their preferences. We get, um, you know, it, wh- who their favorite sports team is. And, and, and maybe we'll take them to a sports team um, and, uh, uh, event and stuff like that. We've got a couple of um, wow factors that are, are, are really cool. I mean, we, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, this is, it, it's, it's not a gimmick. Uh, we, we have very in-depth relationships with our clients. And um, I think a lot of advisors do these things to, to kind of say, well, I, I need to get them the preferred drink. I need to um, you know, take them to lunch. And, and those things are great. But we want to do these things because we, we truly have great relationships with these clients. And so here's an example. We had a client, um, this was earlier this year, who her husband passed away. And it was a really bad, it, it was a very sudden, it was a, it was a bad moment, oh, obviously. Yeah. Oh, that's um, and so I was out of town. Um, but because we're a smaller team, one of the other advisors and two of our admins went to the, the funeral um, client obviously appreciated us showing up, you know, we're, we're there for a client. Um, this client was so distraught. She could no longer live in this house. Uh, so she, she ended up moving from the house, um, and went to close on a new house. And so one of our other advisors went to her house closing with her and, and we mm-hmm. brought her, uh, some, some flowers and she cried and she was very excited about someone being there and holding her hand. Cause she, she didn't know this. She didn't know how to, how to go to a house closing. That was new for her. Her husband yeah. did that. Um, and so then, at, 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 so that's when she sold her house. When she went to the other house closing to purchase her, her next house, we had another advisor go to that house closing. Um, and he's actually an artist as well. So he drew her a picture of her old house and put it in a frame and gave it to her. And she she was she was just amazed at you know the the level of care she'll never forget that. And those, that's how you build lifelong relationships. And during a transition like this, um, she, she's, she loves our team, right? It's not, it's not, it's not one individual. It's a team that did that. And that's part of why our succession plan works so well, Michael, it's a team, uh, not an individual. So out of curiosity, just how do you systematically get and keep track of all this favorite restaurant, favorite wine, (laughs) Yeah, that's uh, it's it's not easy to do. You, I so as, as you know, for example, like for for some of these A clients, as as we call them, um, I'll communicate with them at least quarterly, and I have a pretty good idea of what they're doing and when they're going on vacations and when their anniversaries are. We we know all that information from when they onboarded. We ask those questions, and so <clears throat> we we actually track in um, our EOS system that entrepreneur operating system one of the metrics you can track is wow factors. And so we track, we want to make sure that we are giving uh, those clients wow factors every single year. And so we are very active with trying to pull that data and information out of our clients and asking, where are you going on vacation? What restaurants are you going to? We take, we take notes of when they come into our office, what are they drinking? Is it water? Are they asking for diet Coke or Dr. Pepper? We take note of all of that, write it down. We, we do put it in our CRM, which, which is Redtail. Um, and so next time they come in, we're not even asking them if they want uh, Diet Coke. It's just going to be open and st- not open, but it's just going to be sitting there on yeah. the table waiting for them to open. Um, and it's stuff like that. They're like, wow, I, you know, it's, it sounds small, but wow, you remembered that I like Diet, Diet Coke or, or wow, you remember that I like co- coffee that's black. Um, it's the small things and they really appreciate that. So how much of this are like things you ask in a, an onboarding questionnaire versus just trying to capture it in the flow of conversation, interactions with clients and, and being mindful enough to, to write it down and, and get it in the CRM for next time? This is a part of it, – it's always changing for us. We're always trying to uh, constantly improve and be better. So we used to not ask this during our onboarding process, but I would say probably within the last two months, we in- updated our onboarding questionnaire of, now we do ask, what is your favorite drink? What is your favorite sports team? What is your favorite hobby? We ask those types of questions and we record that in the CRM 
b- before two months ago, it was simply just asking questions um, in conversation of, oh, yeah, what are you doing this weekend? Oh, y'all are going to uh, uh, out to dinner. OK, well, hey, let's send you an appetizer or, um, you know, so it's just in conversation trying to catch up on those things and pick up on w- what are their hobbies? What are the habits? Making a mental note of it. Um, and then setting a task to be intentional to follow up and see 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 what we can do to overserve them. So, what else do you do in the client service matrix to just try to vary services by A B C D? I mean, I feel like it's a challenge for a lot of firms just figuring out like what what do you actually do differently? Because as you noted, like you're you're not going to not take the phone call when, right, they, right. when they reach out. You're not going to not do the analysis that's necessary to give them the right advice when they ask a question. So where, where else have you been able to try to make some distinctions? I, I'm hearing like frequency of frequency of meetings and how often you reach out to, to set meetings, you know, at the a clients, it's the like, and we'll even go out with you to your estate planning attorney. We'll go, we'll, we'll sit down with your CPA are there are there other things that you've you've put into this matrix? Yeah, there there, there certainly are. Um, we have different uh, what we call appreciation events, uh, where a clients we try to reach out to them specifically and try to do something more uh, focused for them as a group. Um, okay. and, and keep in mind, this is still expanding. Our, our client service matrix, we updated this <laughs> about five months ago. Um, so before this, it didn't quite look like what it is. But this year, for you know, we, we've made a big effort to reach out to clients to take them to their favorite restaurant oh, and, and tell them to invite a friend or uh, tell them to um, and 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 invite a friend okay and so invite a friend and invite a friend an opportunity it, it is uh-huh. or you know we I, I love to golf uh, i'll ask someone if they want to go golf we'll, we'll take them maybe their son maybe their their best friend and uh, take them golfing for for an afternoon and and so it's stuff like that, you know, it's, it's, it's still a work in progress, but, um, it's, it's more of the proactive reach out. How can we deepen these relationships? Uh, and, and the scope of the financial plan increases at, with the more assets that someone would have. And so, um, again, I, I don't think someone who has, you know, a hundred thousand dollars needs the same necessarily in depth plan as someone who has $5 million. And, right. um, and there's just and so, more stuff going on. There's there just is. more. More parts moving and, and more Correct. dollars that get impacted. Absolutely, and and we we utilize services like Holista Plan, for example. I, in my in my prior career, I was a CPA. I, I am a CPA, but I practice as a CPA. Um, and, and so the you know we do start incorporating Holista Plan um, once you get into a certain level of that client service matrix. Um, and we start getting into, you know, money. We use Money Guide Elite or Money Guide Pro, and they use this uh, Wealth Studios module. So once you get to a certain threshold, we do overlay the estate plan on the financial plan and start uh, modeling that out in a flow of funds if something was to happen to either, either one of the spouses. Um, and so, yeah, it, 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 it's a different level of the scope of financial plan, and it's also a different level of how often we proactively reach out. So, do, do you show and convey this? to clients or is this more of an internal document for just your own team's understanding of who who how what are we doing for clients and then making sure that we're we're tracking and implementing that it's an internal document for us when when someone comes in um you know our process is we we do an initial phone call uh, then we have an initial meeting where after that initial in person meeting we send them our data gathering form, which is electronic. We, we, we use precise FP for that. And so we have, during these conversations, uh, we've, we've had, a, again, a phone call and an in-person meeting. We have a really good idea of who they are, uh, their, their, their needs, and, and what we can do for them. Um, and so we, we have our client service matrix memorized. And when a client asks, you know, what's the process look like? We will tell them, right. um, well, here's what you can expect from us. You can expect um, a tax review and a state review, uh, you know, et cetera. We'll, we'll reach out to you four times a year. We, you know, we're, we're going to be very proactive in how we reach out to you um, and serve you in these ways. And so we lay out the expectations up front. I, I do believe that Clients leave um, because they have a certain expectation, R- right or wrong. They have an expectation, and if that expectation is not met, 
then they leave. And so we, we asked them, Hey, what are your expectations? And I asked them in, in, in that meeting, that the initial meeting, what are your expectations of us? And I want to just make sure that we close that gap. And so you can expect um, a certain service level. Um, and so they walk away knowing exactly what they, what, what services we offer, what, what they should be expecting. And so there's no open-ended questions and um, send them on their way. And that they're, they're very informed um, with what we do. And so then where does the G tier <laughs> kick in that you mentioned earlier? So this is actually pretty funny. We, so the client service matrix isn't perfect, right? You know, you've got the A, you got the A's, the B's, the C's and the D's. And well, what about that young doctor who he's got a lot of debt and he doesn't have a net worth and he doesn't really have any liquid assets. And it's, again, it's still the right thing to do to help them. And even if they don't, you know, fund an account with us, we still want to help and serve them. And so how do we capture that type of client? And we still want to serve them and give them a great level of service and um, call them and, and, and take them and, and, and do these wow factors with them. So we, we came up with G um, and G stands for growth. <laughs> and so what it really means for us is it means that they have the potential to be an ideal client. And so we don't want to label them as, as a D client. We do want to separate them a little bit and say, hey, these are, this is a group of people that we still want to pursue and, 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 and have these very intentional um, service, a service model for them because we want to have a really great long-term relationship with, with that group. And, and so how do you handle just the, the servicing and support of them along the way? I mean, do they – do they map to an A, B, C, or D in terms of services, or do you just have to make like a whole other list of what you you do and don't do for them because they may literally not even have an account with you? That's a great question. We, we actually map them uh, to a C client. And okay. so that's an individual, again, who, if you think about who they are, they probably have um, budget issues, cash flow planning issues. And so right. we do meet with that type of individual twice a year. Um, and we're proactive with making sure that they come into our office and we're, you know, we're an accountability partner for them. Are, are right. you paying down that debt? Are you doing the things we talked about that you need to do and trying to hold them accountable so that they can get to where they want to be? And so that's what we do for that threshold. Okay. Very cool. Very cool. So now I, I think we've got a pretty good understanding of where the practice is. So now take us back to how you came to this firm and journey in the first place. So um, I, I have a very, in my opinion, <laughs> unique journey. Um, in 2012, I graduated from college and I actually went into public accounting. Um, my personality is not, uh, and I hope this doesn't offend any public accountants out there, but my personality is not someone who can work 80 hours a week and travel 100 days a year. Um, you know, and that's what I was doing in public accounting. And so I wanted to take that skill set and instead of uh, auditing uh, organizations and helping these organizations, I wanted to take that skill set and do something a little bit different, help people, um, help, help change some lives and see the impact of, of those results. And so I was actually at a homecoming game for uh, the high school I went to, and I ran into a gentleman whose daughter I actually went to high school with, and I've known for practically my whole life, and his name is Reggie. And I started talking with Reggie at this homecoming game, and he was also a CPA, and he asked me a little bit about my background. Hey, what are you doing? And I told him I'm in public accounting. And keep in mind, this was in, in 2012, and I was telling him all the travel and hours, and, and he laughed, and he said, man, I, I hate it for you. I also used to be a CPA and, and, and was in that world, and he gave me some information. He said, don't, don't do it for too long. Um, you'll get burnt out, and uh, he was right, and, and fast forward um, about, four, about four years after that, I actually ran into his daughter. Um, at my, my wife at the time, she played uh, rec league soccer. And she was playing on a soccer game and uh, Reggie's daughter was also on that team. And I ran into her and I said, I need to reach back out to your dad because, you know, four, four years have passed and I need to, I need to reach out because I am continuing uh, to be, to be miserable working in public accounting. <laughs> and so she said, he'd love it. In fact, you know, he, he quit the public accounting world, as you know, and, and he's a financial advisor and he's actually looking for someone to take under his wing because he, he needs to retire someday. And I thought, wow, that's kind of a cool, unique opportunity. Mm. And so I, I messaged him on LinkedIn and 
Next thing you know, we had coffee. Uh, we had a second uh, round of coffees and he, he made me a job offer and I was ecstatic. I thought, man, this is exactly what I've been waiting for. Um, and so, and I, I, I didn't know, you know, in the back of his mind, what, what he was thinking at this point, but from his perspective, he wanted someone because our, our clientele has a, a certain need for someone who understands a, a, a deeper level of tax and, because that was his background. He's a tax advisor and a lot, a lot of his former clients in the CPA world came over to be his financial advising clients. And so they're used to this financial advice that is in-depth tax planning. And so he was specifically looking for a CPA and, um, and it just, it worked out so well. So he hired me in 2016 and um, what, what Reggie did for me, uh, I, I honestly think no, no human being would have done for someone that he took a chance on me when, when no one else would. He, he trained me um, from the get go with the understanding of uh, if this worked out, I had the opportunity to buy the practice from him and continue his legacy. And what a unique opportunity he gave me. And I, I knew what was at stake. I knew that it, I, I, if, if I had what it takes, if I, if I made the relationships work, if I worked hard, I knew it was at, um, at stake here. And so I try to learn everything I could. I, this is the first and only financial advisor firm I've ever worked at. And so I learned everything I could. I picked up every book. I listened to every podcast. I try to figure out how can I serve clients. And um, roughly in 2018, keep in mind, I, I had probably worked for him for about two years. Um, he came up to me and said, I think I think I want to start talking to you about our secession plan. I think, he, I, think I, I might want to eventually sell the practice to you. And so um, eventually he did. And what a humbling moment. Um, I, I, I can't say that I would have done the same thing if I was in his shoes. And so again, um, what that man did for me, I don't, I don't think many people would have done for, for someone else. So when, when you came on in 2016, it was, it sounds like it, it was nominally in the direction of I'm going to train you and develop you here at the firm. And if this works out, then I've got a succession need in the future and and you're going to be heir apparent at that point. But it was not like there was no written agreement when you went there and took the job that said like Reggie will sell to me in X years. Like this was, this was proverbial handshake promise at this point. Yeah, I, I would say when, when he hired me, um, <clears throat> there was absolutely no agreement. Um, in fact, Michael, I, you know, when, when I took the job, um, I actually took a, a pretty large pay cut and I, I was willing to do it. One, you know, money doesn't make people happy and it certainly didn't make me happy. I, in, in the public accounting firm I worked at, when you looked at the partners who were there, they were all miserable. I mean, they did not have the family life. They, their kids weren't involved in, in the dad. The dad wasn't involved in the kid's life. Um, and I just, I was married at the time and I just did not want that for my life. And so I was willing to take that pay cut. Um, and so when Reggie hired me, he knew, I knew what it could be, uh, but it was, it was essentially mine to earn. It wasn't going to be handed to me. And so, yeah, I knew it was an opportunity that was there, but there was no agreement. It was, Hey, you need to get trained. You, you have to take all of these tests. <laughs> you have to take, uh, you have to get your CFP and that's going to take a couple of years. And if you can do it, maybe one day we'll talk about a secession plan. So yeah, from day one, I knew it was a possibility, but not, not anything written in stone. So out of curiosity, how, how much of a step back was it on salary on comp to like to do <laughs> this industry career change? Yeah. I will tell you it was it was over fifty percent pay cut. Um, wow! It, it was, and um, I I don't look back. Like it to me, it was it was an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't sit here and think, man, I can't believe I took a fifty percent pay cut. I look at it as, um, you know, it, nothing's handed to you, right? It, it's it's earned, and um, I I had to if I wanted to increase my pay, right? I had to I had to get out there and I had to bust it. I saw this moment as my opportunity. And if I didn't jump on it, I was going to be retiring from a CPA world that um, didn't leave me satisfied and fulfilled. I, I saw this as my opportunity to do something different and live a fulfilled life. So what did the practice look like then? I don't know if you recall or, or remember, like, 
I guess by like assets or, or clients or revenue, like what was the business when you showed up in 2016 and Reggie was saying, I'm, I'm looking at a, at a potential successor here. Yeah. In 2016, um, we managed roughly 110 million in assets. And, um, at that point it was Reggie, uh, he had a junior advisor at the time and he had uh, an office manager who is the only office manager he's ever had. Um, she's still with us today. She's worked for him for over 20 years and she's, she's absolutely amazing. Wow. That's um, and awesome. then it was, so it was essentially the three of them. And then they had, they had a part-time uh, secretary that would answer phones. Okay. Okay. And do you know how many clients it was roughly? Uh, it, it, it was roughly 110 clients. Um, so, you know, I, keep in mind in 2016, we, we didn't keep track as as much as we probably do now. So I, I have gone back and tried to pull different reports to back into that number, but it's about 110 clients, 110 households. So, I mean, he had a class of like a pretty healthy looking practice, like 110 million of assets, a hundred something clients. So like the average client is a million ish or, or so. So like the practice was, it sounds like that practice was in a pretty good place when you came in. It was. It definitely was. What comes next? Like he says in 2018, I think I actually want to start talking about our succession plan and 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 make this happen. So, what what came next to actually start making this happen? He uh, he and I had open communication from from day one, and I would say that that was key. And so at, at no point did uh, any of this come as a surprise to me. Where you know there was, I don't remember a conversation of Alex. Today's the day where we need to have a conversation about uh, the secession plan. But in in 2018, um, we did get into more detail. And and if if you take a step back and think about where we were as a practice, you know, Reggie led every meeting. And he was the scene as the guy who was leading everything, doing everything, as he should have been. He was the, the lead advisor and owner. And I was the junior advisor at that point. And I was in these meetings, but I was a silent partner. I was taking notes. I was doing the follow-up and the analysis. And so I do remember having a conversation of, hey, Alex, you know, eventually you might be the guy who takes over this practice and we need to get you leading these meetings. And so we started in 2018 um, getting me more involved in leading the, uh, the larger net worth clients. And so we had great conversation about getting involved with the larger clients, trying to see me as the lead advisor in their, in the client's eyes. And so we quite literally would, um, we would switch seats in the next meeting. I would be in the lead advisor seat and he would be in the uh, junior advisor seat as, as it were. Because you, you had kind of a standard set up around the table of literally like the client sits there, Reggie sits here. That's quote the lead advisor seat. The person who's taking notes sits over there. So like there were essentially the the standard assigned seats and you literally switch seats. We literally did. Yeah. We, the, the lead advisor would have a keyboard and a mouse on the table and we would um, basically throw everything up on a screen to where clients could see it in the conference room. And so whoever is in charge of the meeting is sitting in front of that keyboard and mouse. And so we would literally switch seats the next meeting and I would be uh, in charge of the meeting and I would be um, running the analysis with the clients and doing uh, financial planning and talking about their investments and estate plan. And so that would be, be the, the, the next meeting. And Reggie was always uh, really gracious about that in that meeting. He would say this, you know, you guys know, Alex, uh, he's going to be the future of the practice and I want you guys to get to know him a little bit better. And so uh, clients were like, okay, this is great. We'll start listening to Alex a little bit. And so the next year after that, uh, Reggie just wouldn't even be in the meeting. And it would just be me in the meeting alone with the clients. And Reggie was still there. He was an advisor. You know, This is probably 2019 at that point. And uh, after the meeting was over, Reggie would come out and say, hello, how was the meeting? And they would say, you know, things are going well. It was a good meeting. And um, they would go along their way. And then in 2020, when I pulled the trigger and bought the practice from Reggie, there was not a single client that was surprised. Everyone could kind of see what was happening. Reggie had conversations with everybody about um, Alex is the future of the firm. Uh, You get to work with him for two years before we pull the trigger on this. And then when it was announced in 2020, 
there was not one surprise. Uh, n- no client called and said, "I, you know, I didn't see that coming." Um, it was right. so. So I'm, I'm struck by just some of the, I guess, the language and framing here. So Reggie didn't come in and say, "Well, you know, I'm going to be retiring soon, and Alex is your new advisor." I feel like he, he if if this language is, is sort of verbatim, like he had a softer framing to this. Just you know, you know, Alex, he's going to be the future of the practice, right? I'm presuming if we just look across the table, like you're a few decades younger than Reggie. So everyone kind of gets what's going yeah, yeah. what's going on here. But Reggie's just saying, this is Alex. He's going to be the future of the practice. So I want you to get to know him better. And you're leading that meeting. And he's still there for the proverbial lifeline. Uh, and that was how you set it up and did the progression. So then 2020 really was the first time anybody said Reggie's retiring. Right. But they could sort of read it earlier, but you didn't actually say it that way earlier, right? You know, there there was there was never a um, I am retiring, and 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 you know, Reggie did not know uh, when he wanted to retire. He, we, he didn't know it was going to be January first, twenty twenty. So in twenty eighteen, <clears throat> he's telling clients, he says, I, "I'm not getting younger." Um, I I I, I want to go out on top. I, I don't want to stay in this practice forever, and and, and, and go out um, with, with, you know, on a decline. And so, yeah, he, he told everybody up front, you know, Alex is, he's good. He can do this. Alex is someone that you guys can create a relationship with and not miss a beat. Um, and, and just take my word for it, sit in the meeting with Alex and, it, and it'll, and it'll work out. And, and everyone after those meetings would go up to Reggie and say, you're right. This is, um, this has been a pretty good meeting. And, um, and it gave Reggie a lot of comfort. Like he, he got a lot of valuable feedback before he sold it, uh, from clients that, you know, Hey, this is great. Yeah. You picked a, you picked a great junior advisor. I have no problem with this. So Reggie felt comfortable, um, with who he was selling the practice to, that he knew it would work out. Right. And, and I felt comfortable because I knew all of the clients. And so both of us felt really good about possibly signing some paperwork. And in 2019, um, I'm not sure what happened. Uh, n- nothing really happened. Just Reggie, I think he just felt like it was time. Um, he saw the writing on the wall, I guess, just of, you know, he put a really good, um, his whole life work into this and he was ready to retire, ready for that next stage. And, he came up to me one day, asked me to have a meeting with him, and we sat down and he said, hey, I'm ready to sell the practice to you. And I thought, oh boy, <laughs> here we go. Um, and it, it, that was that. I mean, we, we came up with an agreement. We got it valued. We, um, you know, here I am at the time, I was 29 years old. And I think in 2020, uh, we managed at that point that I'm rounding pro- probably roughly 185 million in assets. And here I am at 29 years old with this opportunity in front of me. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm shaking. I'm, I, I, I need to do this. This is my opportunity. Um, and so I, we went for it and, and it worked out. So, so you're heading in 2020. So you said the, the practice was about 185 million of assets. I'm assuming then you know, if you're running similarly, like you're, one and a half million of revenue or a little bit higher at that point at the, at the billing rate that you were at. So like, that's the, that's the chunk of practice that you're buying into. Correct. Yeah. We, that, that was about exactly where we were. Um, and you know, think about it. I'm 29 years old. I don't have a net worth. Um, I'm, I'm, I probably just finished paying off my student loans at this point. And so, Reggie absolutely had other opportunities. Um, you know, we, and we can get into the weeds of this if you'd like, but uh, Reggie, so, someone had heard that Reggie was potentially retiring and a bank actually came in and started having conversations with him and they started making offers and having conversations. And Reggie had an opportunity to sell to a bank upfront cash up front. Obviously, that's a lower risk opportunity for him. He could have walked away, and his his clients would have been served just fine. Um, but I had a conversation with him, and, and he sat down and told me. He said, "No, I told you that you were the future. I told you I would give you a chance, and so I'm going to let you have the chance." And he turned down an offer from a bank, which I, I promise you was more money than what I could have paid him. Um, so was the was the bank? Got, I mean, do you know was the bank offering like a a better valuation or just 
better better terms in that they would do it they would do it all all cash up front and you were going to have to have some some financing contingencies i would say both michael uh, more more cash up front it was an opportunity for him um, to cash in his life's work if you will and um, at a, at a higher value re- realistically um, I, I knew that if reggie was to sell me the practice he would have to probably sell that at a discount so i could get some financing from somewhere um, and not only that you know when you when you pay someone out over five or ten years it's a higher risk to the seller they what what would happen if i'm the the new owner and i'm only 29 years old and i tank the business and i couldn't do it um, reggie's out of his retirement and and everyone else is out of a job and so the leap of faith that that that, that man did um, was, was immense, and and he he absolutely could have gone to a bank, but he didn't. So how did you do the the valuation? Did you try to come to some kind of agreement about uh, multiples or price, or did you like go out to a third party service to get it valued? We used FP Transitions, okay, and, and I can't speak highly enough of them. Um, Reggie engaged with them. We got a valuation and they gave us a lot of great information on there, there's so many ways a transition could go. There's not a right or wrong answer. Um, you know, you, you can do cash up front for a little bit lower multiple. You can spread it out over five or 10 years for a little bit of a higher multiple. You can do anything in between there. Um, FP transition was great to work with. They, they created all of the uh, agreements that we signed. Um, they're, you know, you can do an asset sale or a stock sale. So we had to talk about pros and cons of that. Um, which, which, which did you go with and how did you decide? Yeah, we, we went with an asset sale. Um, and it's for, for us, it was more of the liability perspective, right? If it was just a stock sale, um, all the future liability of, of all the decisions that were made prior to that point were, were, they still existed. The, that, that exact firm still existed. And so, um, at the time, we had a different name. Our, our company was um, Bone Financial Group, which is Reggie's last name. So um, Bone Financial Group at the time. And so we changed the name. We did an asset sale. We um, started our, our Blackbridge Financial is who we are now. And um, that worked out pretty well. So we uh, basically, I, I purchased the assets, uh, or the, the book from Reggie. And um, f- from that perspective, it worked out pretty well. And can I ask, like, what was the what was the valuation? I mean, was it like a, a a multiple of revenue, a multiple of earnings? Where did where did they guide you to set it? This is one of those that you know. Keep in mind, this is the only deal I've done, and at the yeah. time, um, I didn't have all the knowledge um, of, of all these transitions. I think the the transition world, the the mergers and acquisition world, really picked up after twenty twenty. I feel like the, everyone yeah. left and right right now is is purchasing a, an advisory firm. But yeah, we did a, a multiple of, of production. So our multiple uh, that FP Transitions came up with was about two point two. So I think at the time that okay. was uh, slightly better than average. I think at, you know at the time I think multiples were going for about two, um, and so that's what we did. And and. Then it was, okay, how do you get financing? I actually went to our broker dealer. Uh, we, we broker through LPL. I went to our broker dealer and I applied for financing. I applied at a couple other banks. And given my net worth and zero history of owning a business, it's no surprise right. that I got, I got denied. And so here we are again, like, okay, well, how do we make this work? Uh, so Reggie, yet again, um, came in to, to save the day. He, he self, he owner financed it. And so... Um, Reggie and I signed a note where I would pay him uh, out of revenue of the firm for five years. And that's, that's what we did. And there were some restrictive covenants on that loan. Um, it, and so, you know, there were things like if I wanted to hire another team member, um, I, I, Reggie and I would have to have a conversation about that and he'd, he'd have to agree to that. And, um, if I, I, I wasn't allowed to increase my salary, that's another example. So, um, you know, here I am at that point owning a, a, a pretty large advisory practice and my salary is about the same as it was the year before. And um, so those were all challenges, but, you know, again, we owner financed it. It was a five-year period. 
I'm happy to say that um, 2020 was not an easy year. You know, if, had you told me that uh, three months after I bought the firm, the market would pr- pretty much crash. Um, I, I, you know, if I had a crystal ball, I maybe would have done something different. But, um, you know, I do remember specifically Reggie came into my office one day and he sat me down and he said, hey, I, we obviously know the market's going crazy. Um, try not to let this worry you. We're going to we're going to work this out. And I, we both want this transition to be a success. And so um, yeah, I will say that is one pro of of someone owner financing rather than working with a bank. I think it would have been – if it got, I don't think the bank would have come and said, you know, it's yeah. tough market time. Like, we don't worry, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll work this out. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, I know that's unusual for for most, right? And no one's, no one's going to say, you know, we'll work this out. But um, that certainly helped. So, so I just want to make sure I understand this kind of owner – owner finance structure paying out over over five years out of the the revenue of the firm so was this like you know a, a, like a five-year amortizing payment of of the of the balance of the the valuation or was this literally a like revenue base like well Reggie gets 45 percent of revenue for five years which if I math out is like 2.2 2, uh, uh times revenue but like he's he's getting literally a percentage of revenue with the ups and downs that go with it. It was not a percentage of revenue. It was okay. an actual fixed note. And okay. w- looking back on it, um, you know, you're going through COVID, the market's in a free fall. I-, I remember at that point of my life thinking, man, I really wished I had pushed a little bit more of considering either a clawback provision or making this a percentage of revenue because those were scary days, Michael, as you know. I mean, I think yep. and I'm not exaggerating when I say this. At the end of 2020, uh, the business's net income w- was about eleven dollars. It, it, it was it was a very tough time. But you know, congratulations, you're yeah, like a multi-million you. dollar practice and you made eleven dollars. <laughs> well, you know, the, the loan was fixed, right? And, you know, yeah. uh, it, fr- from a cash flow perspective, it would, that loan was fixed. The interest was high, and um, uh-huh. you know, I, I <laughs> it just is what it is. Um, oh man, yeah. so. Uh, and, and so I, I guess so. Some of these restrictive covenants around not increasing your salary, not hiring team members, was just to prevent the situation where you know you you jack up your salary, yank lots of dollars out of the business, and then go back and say like, "Oh, I'm sorry, I defaulted. I can't make the payments." And someone says like, "Well, that's because you yanked all the cash out of the business in other ways." So the the covenants were meant to preserve the financial health of the business to be able to make the loan payments, which. I guess ironically, it sounds like it did with perfect precision and eleven dollars to spare. It was, I mean, it was a bullseye. We nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely negotiated. Yes, well it, done, everyone. It was. I, yeah, it, it worked out great. Uh, yeah, you again. Um, yeah, those those debt covenants really protected Reggie, and and I, if I was in his shoes, I would have done at least the same. Um, you know, here you are putting your life's work in the hands of a 29 year old. And um, if he tanks it, right, if he, if he, if he increases his salary, if he's hiring people and, um, y- you know, and you see that, that net income disappearing, how's he going to make loan payments? And so it was a, there was a lot of trust there. I mean, he, he absolutely trusted me with his entire retirement. It, it was uh, quite astonishing that the amount of trust that he put in a 29 year old. So, so now help us help talk us through more what happens Next, I mean, I guess just I'm still curious out of the gate, you know, no joke, like you, you signed this thing on one one, and what would be nine weeks later, like the world starts ending. So what's like, what is going on? What is going through your, your head when you've taken on like seven figures of debt? And now you watch revenue tank, whatever it would have been like 20% in March of 2020. Yeah, it did. I'll I'll tell you that was definitely the most challenging time of my life. Um, lots of sleepless nights. We, um, you know, my wife and I, we were starting our family. We were young. We, um, I, I, I probably didn't. I feel like I didn't sleep for the entire first quarter of, of 2020. You know, first you're 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 a little bit scared. You just bought a business, and second, COVID hits, and third, the market's tanking, and fourth, what what if clients leave? Uh, because now that their accounts are going down and here, here's this new guy, he obviously can't manage money because the market's tanking. And, um, you know, all these things run through your head. And 
at the time, and, and I still do, I, I have imposter syndrome where, um, you know, my goodness, what if someone finds out that, um, you know, there's other better financial advisors out there. And I really struggle with a lot of anxiety, so much so I, I even I even got some professional help and, and I'm not ashamed at that at all. I I had to get, get anxiety medicine to help me uh, calm down a little bit. It was a very scary time. Um, no, no doubt about it, but I, I'm a praying man. I prayed a lot. I prayed to the Lord, uh, you know, Hey, make this what it is, right? This is in your hands, not in mine. And, um, you know, I, I, I shot my shot. I did the best I could. And if it worked out great, if it didn't, you know, I, I did the best I could. And, um, I, I will say by the end of 2020, um, 2020 ended up being one of our better growth years. Um, the first first half of the year was was rough. Um, the second half of the year, and, and keep in mind, yes, we did end the year with 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 low net income. Um, but when you you know you you, you charge in the, the the fees don't necessarily hit until the next quarter, right? And so I think the, right. the last quarter of of, of 2020 <clears throat> ended up being a pretty good quarter for us. Um, and that's really when the growth started to take off. Right. And so the the market bounces back in Q3 and plowing heavily into into Q4. So your your AUM looks great on 1231, but your billing on that great 1231 AUM that's that's Q1 2021 revenue. So I mean, you get it, but like it doesn't show up in your it doesn't show up on the books in 2020. Correct. And what I what I did in um, November of 2020, because uh, I had seen you know we're we're getting uh, gaining ground on some of these assets, and I saw some of the writing on the wall, and th- thinking, hey, you know this is this is improving, and uh, we're going to make it. Um, I ended up reaching back out to LPL uh, to see if at this point they would refinance my loan. Mm. And, I, and I and I got on the phone with them, and I I said, listen, I made it through 2020. If I can make it through that, I can make it through anything. Please refinance this loan. Um, cause you know, I, I didn't want Reggie to be burdened to, yeah. to, to, to me. I mean, I, I just felt a, a responsibility to refinance it and get him one lump sum check. I, d- I don't know. He didn't ask me to do it. He didn't even know I was going to do this, but, um, arguably I got a, I got a worse rate. You know, I think our loan at the time with Reggie was 6%, um, which was, which is reasonable and pretty good. And then with LPL, I think it was about 6.25%. So, uh, arguably a, a worse rate. I will admit, yeah, not, not a huge spread, but when it's a seven-figure loan, like yeah. you feel that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, order point. If you do the math on that, it, it, it's, it, it turns out to be a large number. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> but another thing it did was it ex- extended my loan from five years to ten years, and so I was able to get some breathing room. I think from a, a cash flow perspective. And so yeah, I, I walked into Reggie's office. I think this was November 2020, and I said, Reggie. Um, you know, and I, and I was getting pretty emotional with him. Just thank you for everything you've done for me. It, it's I'm I'm so um, overwhelmed with what you've done. But here's a check. I want to make you whole. And and I think our transaction at this point is complete. And uh, I'm pre- pretty sure you could probably pick his jaw up off the desk. That was, but that was a pretty cool moment for both of us. I think. So so where where was the asset base and client base by the time you got to the end of 2020 and and through this craziness? Yeah, so in 20 at the end of 2020, <clears throat> we managed 235 million in assets. So um wow. We 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 ended up growing a lot that year. We were we were 185 at the beginning of the year. Wow. So uh so I'm I'm just visualizing so like as brutal as 2020 was both both from like the overall market volatility and then the 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 pain of basically zeroing your net income. I'm assuming then, like metrics were radically different the next year. Your your revenues up thirty percent. You've already paid down almost twenty percent of the loan on the original five year note, and you re- just recast the remaining four years over ten. So, like revenues up thirty percent, and I don't know what that exact math is on your payments, but like your payments must be down. What they would be down more than half. They 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 were. Um, I, I won't. I won't say this, the specific dollar amount, but this is no exaggeration. Um, my b- before I refinanced, my monthly loan payment was larger than my annual salary the year before. <laughs> so um, it was it was a large amount, um, but it was it was worth it. It's worth it. Wait, say that again. Either your loan payment 
my in, in my, the in the business was higher than your entire salary before you did the purchase. Correct. So my monthly payment in January of 2020 was larger than my annual salary for 2019. So so how do you get comfortable with that? I mean, I, I've been struck by I feel like there's a lot of discussions in the industry these days around you know, reasonable valuations, reasonable buy-ins for uh, uh, for successors. And I mean, from what you're saying, particularly five years ago, like practices were still largely going for 2x. You bought for 2.2x. Like you, you, you paid a market rate. Uh, you know, that, that does, that's not a deal that screams like I got the big internal successor uh, a discount. The math worked fine, a little tight near one, but like the math worked fine. Uh, but you have to get comfortable with my monthly payment in January is larger yeah. than my entire salary last year. Yeah. So what, I, I guess both before and after, like what goes through your head to be comfortable to do that deal? And then what's it like after you get in, <laughs> you're yeah. going, what did I just do to myself? <laughs> well, Michael, there's really two things here. Um, I think first and foremost, I trusted Reggie. And we, I, I never, I never thought I would need um, assistance, but I trusted Reggie that Reggie's not going to put me out of my house. He's not going to let my family go hungry. And there's a lot of trust when you do business with someone. I think w w whether a client works with an advisor, whether you're purchasing a practice, you have to trust who you're working with. And so that was number one. And then number two, you have to be prepared. Um, if you saw the spreadsheet I have behind the scenes, um, you know, here I am, a, a CPA, CFP, and um, I, I, I can spreadsheet with, with the best of them. I, I had um, a spreadsheet that said, you know, what happens if revenue fell 20%, 30%, 40%? What is my break even? I had all of these things calculating, you know, if, assuming my expenses were fixed. What if my revenue falls? Uh, I added in my new loan payment. Um, and I knew, Where? I knew that I had about a 36% buffer. That was the magic number. And so I said, you know what, what are the odds <laughs> that the market falls 36%, um, you know, between, <laughs> and, then between you use mo and then you use most of that, mar you use most yeah. of that decline budget in like three weeks in March. Oh yeah. I, and then, and then I'm, yeah, I'm watching the spreadsheet that I did and it, you know, <laughs> the, the margin fell from, um, it started falling. And so I saw, okay, production's falling 10%, 20%. And so, oh, wait, we're getting pretty close to that break even number. But um, nonetheless, I knew I had a break even number. And I did know mathematically I was going to be fine. And so, twofold well, again, I trusted Reggie immensely. Um, and then financially, I was prepared mathematically. I, I knew there was wiggle room. And our, 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 our book has pretty good margin, I would assume. Um, and it worked. And I guess that's part of the driver at the end of the day was the practice had healthy margins because again, it sounds like you know, uh, Reggie's practice was you know very healthy, like you know close to million dollar households. So just like there's a good amount of revenue uh, to to manage. You don't need a zillion staff uh, when your client when your clients have to write a pretty good check per client on average. So you you did have room buffer. In in the in the practice before this gets really problematic, yeah, that that's absolutely right. We we had a lot of wiggle room, um, and I was really confident in the fact that be, because we do have, in my opinion, such deep relationships with our clients, and it's it's not a gimmick when we do things like draw a picture for a client um, when when there's when they sold their house. It's not a gimmick for us. It's we do that because we love our client and we want to be there for her in a, in a very difficult time. And because Reggie created that culture internally, we continued that. And not a single client left uh, during this transition. You know, and, and, I, and we were prepared. I, 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 we did another analysis that said, well, what if we lost these clients? You know, we obviously had a list of clients that you know, were on the maybe they don't stay list. And um, I'm, I cannot believe not a single one of them left through the transition or a down market. They trusted us. They... Um, they, it's a relationship, just like I trusted Reggie, they trusted me. So how has the business changed over the past three years since you got through this initial, initial tough spot squeeze? So you get to 2021, like you've done the transition, everyone stayed. The last year was harrowing, but now like assets are up, revenue is up. 
the loan's been recast to to 10 years so cash flow is suddenly much better so what like what comes next on this succession journey after the horrible first year well we we started growing um Reggie was still an advisor at the time. Uh, his our, our 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 deal said that he was going to work for two full years, and after that we would just negotiate it year by year. If he wanted to continue to work, great. If if he didn't, I would respect that as well. Did did you have to pay him a a salary over those two years, or was that essentially part just part of the deal and the transaction in the first place? We had a consulting agreement where he was paid a set salary. Uh, for for two years. So we had a two-year okay. contract. And then after that, if we wanted to renegotiate, we would do that on a year-by-year basis. And that was separate from the purchase price for the, the it business? Was. Okay. It was separate. Okay. It was separate. Okay. So so Reggie's still going as an advisor. So paint the rest of the picture for us of what's what's going on at this point. Yeah. We... Um, I quickly knew that we needed some more help. You know, here here we are in 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 2021. Reggie at this point had you know about one year left with me, and I thought, all right, I need to hire someone to help. And so, um, again, I I'm a huge fan of uh, of prayer, and I believe that the Lord opens up doors. You know, I'm sitting here thinking about what am I going to do? How am I going to replace Reggie when he actually stops working? And I had a, this is actually a client of mine who reached out to me at the time and we had lunch and he said, Hey, I'm really interested in your world. And he's a likable guy. And, and but most importantly, he's very trustworthy. He's a hard worker. I I've known him. I've served him over the last few years. Um, and so, you know, I thought, all right, let's give this a shot. And so he came in, uh, he got all of his licenses. He got CFP certified. Um, he joined the team. Um, and then we had to do that one more time. We hired another advisor, continuing to grow. Um, and so you know, we've got a game plan where uh, we're trying to continue the level of service that we've given our clients over the last several years. Um, and as we continue to grow, we'll, we'll keep adding advisors to help serve those clients. So you found someone who, who came in and plowed through like all of his licenses and his CFP certification span of like a year? It, he, it's, it was amazing. So he, he got all of his series licensing um, and insurance license done. I, I want to say it was like in 70 days in total. Um, he is very smart. <laughs> so all right, he's yeah. a sharp guy. <laughs> yeah, he's a pretty sharp guy. He did it really quick. I was very impressed. Um, he then immediately started taking the CFP uh, courses. And I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on when he got licensed because there is the experience requirement, but he knocked right, out the right, test right. within one year. He did. Wow. Um, and as soon as he had the experience, he, he became licensed. And so he he came in and ramped up of the span of this year as Reggie is getting ready to dial down and you're suddenly looking at this and saying, oh, this is way too many clients for just me. That's exactly right. And so... Um, after after I hired that gentleman, um, I quickly realized, hey, this trajectory is it's not slowing down. We're continuing to grow, and uh, this is humbling. And hey, let's do it again. It worked well when we hired the the first advisor. Let's hire a second. Let's duplicate it. Um, now, th- this gentleman that we hired, he he actually he was in college. He was a young guy, and um, he his mom was a financial advisor. And so, growing up, he he knew what a financial advisor was. He actually worked for his mom's practice. Um, in, in, in college and got licensed. And so when I started speaking with him, he was fully licensed in college. And so uh, he graduated and day one came into the office, uh, able to meet with clients. We had obviously had to train him on, on how we did our processes and systems. And, but, um, for day one, he started studying for the CFP exam. And I think within 12 months, he, he passed his test. And I think because he already had the experience, he was able to get certified, um, w- within a year. Wow. I guess what else changed? Was there anything else that changed as you're taking over the practice and ramping up and and Reggie's dialing down? I mean, you've talked a bit about like your 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 service matrix and the client tiers. Like were all were those all things you were doing after Reggie or were those things that were already in the practice b- before Reggie or I guess when Reggie was still there? I think um yeah, I mean when when Reggie was um leading the team, we had what I would call understood processes and procedures. And keep in mind at the time, I think we had, what did I say, like 100 and, 110 or so yep. clients. And 
it, it was fairly simple to, okay, well, so-and-so has a meeting coming up. We, we know them really well. So we know what walking into that meeting, what we need to do. Yeah. But when, when you're just growing, um, it's hard to look at a process that's not written down and tweak it and improve it and systematize it. I've done the Clifton Strengths Finder, and one of my um, strengths is uh, I'm a lifelong lifelong learner. Mm-hmm. And so, just naturally through that, I started reading books of how do we systematize? What what do we do to you know? How do you run a business? How do you um, put processes in place and make things duplicatable and repeatable? And um, so, you know, I read several books. Actually, ironically, I got we got the whole team to read these books together. You know, we read. So, what were the books of choice? Oh man, I could go through them. Um, uh, 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 you know, Rocket Fuel uh, by Gina Wickman, Traction. Yep. Um, we also read Five Dysfunctions as a Team, um, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Um, and so, as a team, we we started thinking, hey, let's create um, systems and processes and create workflows. We hadn't had workflows before. So we started what's called EOS, Entrepreneur Operating System. Um, and, if, and if you read those books, you'll, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and so we simply started creating rocks where a, a rock is essentially these mini sprints to get things done to achieve a bigger goal, right? And so we knew we wanted to have processes that we could tweak. Um, and so we had to write them first. And so we wrote down those processes. We were able to start tweaking them. Once we finalized what they were, we put them in a workflow. And so n- now I'm not involved in having to tell all the advisors, hey, don't forget that client has this, 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 and this going on. Now we have a process of um, one person reaches out, gathers data, and then what they hit complete. And then it goes to the next person who fills out their next piece. And then the next person, and then the advisor gets triggered um, about a week before a meeting to go in and review and update everything they need. And so, you know, it's, we've been able to, to create those processes like that. Um, and that's all, and that's all in red tail. Cause that was your CRM of choice. That's correct. And, okay. And we started looking at metrics, different metrics, like how many wow factors are we doing per week? How many clients are we onboarding? How many prospects, how many leads, Who, what's our conversion ratio? We started tracking these things. we, we read together as a team uh, Matthew Jarvis's book, Delivering Massive Value, and, and it, we're not afraid to try something. We've tried it all. I, you know, we, we even did the whole surge meeting thing that Matthew Jarvis uh, recommends, yep. and it worked out great for a little bit. And then we just kept growing, and clients kept calling <laughs> when you're supposed to. Uh, that is that month where you're not supposed to be meeting with clients, and um, it just it. So it was- it was harder by the time you were like three advisors, 300, 400 clients to, to keep that keep that going. There's just so many people. Some of them are always asking for things outside of Surge. Correct. Right, right. And, and so we had to make it, uh, we had to tweak it a little bit to make it fit our team. And that's okay. Um, I think that worked well for Matthew and his team. But for our team, um, you know, we Did created... You- do you still do some kind of adapted version of of surge, or did you simply go back to a you know one x two x four x per year, depending on client tier, and and spread them out? We had we adapted a little bit. So what we do now is we created. Um, I, I love the thought process of, of, of just being intentional with everything. So we started what we call the ideal work week. And so keep in mind, this is the ideal work week. This isn't uh, every work week, but the ideal work week for us is we don't have meetings on Mondays or Fridays. Um, Mondays are our prep days largely. And then Fridays are our recovery days where we can do a lot of our follow-up. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we try to be in a lot of meetings. Um, And so, you know, you might have two meetings in the morning, um, one or two in the afternoon, um, I, you know, I, it, that is difficult. I mean, if you, if you do three a day, um, that's nine a week just for one advisor. Um, and so it, it can get stressful. Uh, so I try to block in there a, a longer lunch. So I like to go to the, to the gym during lunch and try to clear my head for the next, uh, for the afternoon meetings. And so for us, that's how we tweaked it. And then July is a little bit slower. We're intentional with slowing down in July, but we don't tell clients they can't come in or, or we're not going to meet with them until August. We, you know, if someone calls, we're going to serve them. We'll meet with them, but we okay, do try to have a model work week. So you're trying to manage meeting capacity in essence. Like we'll, we'll take what th- three or four meetings a day. It's so like, you know, nine to 12 meetings a week on these three days. We'll try to keep those full. We don't want to do fewer because then you get a backlog. We don't want to do more because then you drown. Uh, 
And and that's the ideal week you try to hold to. In a perfect world, that's how it works. Inevitably, um, you know, we'll have a we'll, we'll we'll have a prospect call and they'll say, hey, "This this actually happened last week." Hey, my four hundred one k plan is shutting down, and the owner needs me to get the funds out like tomorrow. And it's like, <laughs> well, we're booked out for the next three weeks. Um, so situations come up where you do you just have to meet with someone, and. And so we, we squeeze them in. We'll put them in on that Monday or that Friday. It's just, it's part of doing business. It's, there's no black and white. There sometimes is that gray of, yeah, we have a model work week and that is what we're proactive and intentional with, but life happens and we're, and we're there for clients when they need us. So what surprised you the most on this journey of building your own advisory business? I think what surprised me the most um, is this has been such a learning moment for, for trust all around. The amount of trust that Reggie had in me, um, I, I can't say that I would have had in someone else. And I think the amount of trust that our clients had in me um, was was really humbling. You know, I don't I don't know why um, I, I I worked hard and and people stayed, and it's been an absolute blessing. Um, I'm a big believer in you, you can only do what you can do, um, and so there are a lot of sleepless nights, but. Um, I'm just very humbled and blessed with our client base. And that is something I did not expect. So what was the low point on this journey? So let's, let's go back to where we were in 2022. You know, so I mean, we, we just finished our transition. Um, COVID Reg, Reggie's out now, Reggie's, right? Reggie's he, he's stopping, you know, January 1st, 2023. Um, <clears throat> and so we're in 2022, 2022 market's not doing well. We, we have a data provider who gives us a lot of information on how we run models. And they essentially uh, stopped their service to us and they wanted to create a, a TAMP. And their fee structure changed from a reasonable, you know, several hundred dollars a month to 10 basis points. And so at the time, you know, 10 basis points of oh, whatever oh, we like were at the time. 200 plus million dollars. Yeah, so it, like that's a six figure bill. It, it, it was a well into the six figure bill. And so I, I, I literally called and, and, and keep in mind, I still have this, this large note. So what am I going to do? Um, yeah. So here I am, if we want to continue the service, it's, well, do you, do you cut out the service or do you continue to do what clients know? Um, I, I thought we had to continue the service. And so I called our team called all of our clients and I had, let's just call it 400 conversations of, Hey, I'm really sorry. You know, we have to raise your fee by 10 basis points. And oh, I just, I, I hated that conversation. I had that conversation almost 400 times. Um, and we did that and not a single client said no, not a single one. How did you explain it? Uh, um, you know, we, we were just open and honest. I think being open and honest is, is the key here. We, I called him and I said, listen, I do not want to increase your fee. And I said, but think about where we are. You know, this is our process. This is what we do. This is a, a huge factor for us. We have to continue the service. And um, they agreed. They said, you know what? Hey, let's sign the paperwork, 10 basis points. I, you know, it is what it is. Um, I think after everyone signed the paperwork, um, the month, a month later, this organization called me back and they said, you know what? We changed our mind. We're going to revert no. back to the old. No. Oh yeah. And which, which I didn't know whether or not to be jumping up and down for joy or to be really upset. Um, after you did 400, yep. the increase calls yeah, I did. And, and so I did another 400 fee decrease calls right after that. <laughs> and so you called um, everyone back and said they, they undid their fee increase. So I'm going to undo yours. That's exactly right. And obviously there was a lot of pushback. I, I guess this, this firm um, that was trying to create this TAMP, um, it just wasn't going well. And so they went back to their original agreement. And, you know, I, I'll never forget. I had a phone call from one of the individuals at this company and they said, well, we're going to lower our fee, but the good news is you've already increased your fees, so you can just keep that. And I thought to myself, that that's obviously just not the right thing to do. I mean, I, why would it? Anyway, so totally disagreed with that. So, I mean, the next day we, we started calling all of our clients back and just say, thank you so much for trusting in us. But I, that that was a really hard low point, I think, Michael. Oh. Just 
the fee increase at that point, you know, the, you go through COVID, you go through a transition and now they're changing fees on you at that point. That was, that was a very, very difficult time of time of, of owning the firm, but ended up being okay. So I guess I do have to ask though, you know, you were talking earlier about whether you really want to revisit where your fee schedule is starting at 1.5 and, and tearing down, but you did put through a 10 bips increase that not a single client said no to. Right. <clears throat> That's true. Yeah. I mean, our highest fee went up to 1.6% and just, that just didn't feel right. I, I, I just, I, I'm so thankful that it ended up reverting. I just, you know, 1.6 just doesn't feel right. Um, I, I don't know many that chart that much. So it was, it was a very stressful time, but again, not a single client blinked. Um, in fact, I had several great conversations with clients and they said, um, you know what, this is why I go with you guys. This is why I trust you. I mean, you, I had one client say you could have kept that fee. Um, and, and you didn't, you called us and lowered it as soon as you could. Yeah. I, w- I would think the, the goodwill power of being able to call them back and then saying, Hey, the cost went away. So we're going to give that money right back to you is incredibly affirming to the client relationship. Yeah, it, it was. Um, it's, it's been humbling to say the least. So what else do you know now you wish you could <clears throat> go back and tell you like eight years ago when you're first starting to come into the industry and having these conversations with Reggie? I would, I would, I would say, trust your instincts. Don't, don't be afraid to adapt. Um, people are people. If you have to change something, they understand, just have open conversation with them. Um, I mean, I, I think our clients have had any, any change, any transition you can think of, whether it's COVID, uh, fee increases, new advisors, um, but if you're just open and honest, it, it, they trust you that much more. They really do. So I would say trying to enjoy the process a little bit more uh, would have would have been great for me. And, you know, he, it's easy to say on this end of it, looking back, uh-huh. I wish I had enjoyed the process more. But you don't know what you're going through until you're through it. But I'm thankful I went through it. So any other advice you would give younger, newer advisors looking to become a financial planner and start their firm today? I absolutely. I think there's so much conversation of, should I do it this way? Should I do it that way? The answer is yes. Just start, do something, um, be a good person, tell your clients the truth, uh, treat them, overserve them, be there for them when they call. Um, It's going to work out. It's all about trust that you could be the best financial advisor in the world. Uh, but if your clients don't trust you, it, it doesn't mean anything. So start there, lean into relationships, network. Um, I, I wish, I wish someone had told me uh, that this industry existed when I was in public accounting. I truly believe this is the greatest industry in the world. Um, it, you get to help people's dreams come true. You get to see people go from hopeless to hopeful, um, and so I say, if you're thinking about this career, for me, it's been the most fulfilling thing I've ever done in my life. So I'd encourage everybody, if, if, you're, if you're considering it, call someone, job shadow, give it a go. Um, it's probably going to be worth your time. So as we wrap up, this is a, a podcast about success. And, and just one of the themes that comes up is just that word success means, means very different things to different people. And so you're in this wonderful position now with a a very financially successful business that's growing well, the, the notes getting paid down. The the business seems to be in a really good place for you now. So how do you define success for yourself at this point? I think success for me um, is twofold. If I retire and my wife and kids look at me and say, wow, I'm proud of my dad. I'm proud of my husband. Um, and I was there for them. To me, that's success. But more than that, I, I also think that what Reggie did for me, um, I feel so strongly about wanting to duplicate that for another generation. Um, the impact it's had on my life obviously has been immense. I, I can't wait to be on the other end of that and help transition to a next generation and watch them flourish. Um, and so that's, that's going to be success for me is watching this grow into something that's bigger than myself and bigger than our team and watching the next generation run with it one day. What, what an amazing blessing that would be to see it come full circle. 
Very cool. Very cool. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Alex, for joining us on the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thanks, Michael. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits, along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.